to welcome all of his glory nation from east to west to north to south as we bring you the latest teaching in the book of Avavakuk. Can you say that 30 times is the question. Remember in our study of Avavakuk, uh, to go into the Blue Letter Bible, the Blue Letter Bible has a pronunciation key that will help us uh, uh, say the word Avavakuk as best as we possibly can. Um, so we've butchered some of the names. So if you want to ever get the correct name uh, as close to the Hebrew as possible from the English dialogue, uh, use the Blue Letter Bible and they will pronounce it for you. So uh, with that said, this is the, uh, a prayer that the prophet has to the Lord as the Lord is going to rage against the nations. And uh, this is a time that fits for us as well today. The Lord is raging. Um, today is a 8, 8, 18. 8 is the number of a new beginning. 18 is the number of life. This is a 2018 in the Lord, uh, and it's also the year 5,778 in the Hebrew. So there's many, many uh, pointing to numbers. 8 is a new beginning, as we said, and 18 is life. So many things are happening and raging. We've given a prophetic word that the, the end time outpouring of the Holy Spirit is upon us. And the Lord has given uh, in a prophetic word and also in a vision about a, uh, a, a um, spacecraft going off. He has Cape Canaveral, you have 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, and then you have blast off. I was, saying, I was telling yesterday on whatever message we were talking about yesterday that I saw at, uh, a vision of it yesterday. And then I saw uh, a SpaceX launch a missile or a launch a rocket yesterday exactly at the same time, just after I saw the vision. Well, today I was studying something about the United Nations and, and how they were attacking Israel. And I saw it again. It came up that this was, uh, I think it was on Chrismatic Magazine. And then there, there was the number eight that came up and also a rocket ship taking off. So the Lord is telling us that he is raging in these end days. So when we hear the Lord is raging, we don't go put our head down and say, woe is us, as it sounds like Avada Cook is uh, to a degree here. The nations are, God is raging against the nations for, uh, for being unjust and for doing things against his precepts and commandments. But at the same time, a remnant is praying and, and, and lifting up and, and pouring out the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and great revivals can happen simultaneously. And that's what the Lord is doing specifically to the nations today. It's what the Lord was doing here in ancient uh, Israel and Judah. Uh, to the prophets so that they would turn back to the Lord because the nations were raging, uh, the, the Assyrian nation uh, before, and then the nations raging and doing their own thing, and he's literally going to shake the, shake, shake, the, shake the mountains. A lot of these things that we're going to see Habakkuk talk about, you may think, oh, this is just a figure of speech. But the more we get into deep detail of the Lord and uh, quantum physics, you can see that these literally can happen. And the power of God Almighty can literally make a mountain move and he can make a mountain melt. He's got the power in his hands and he has quantum physics to show us that that can happen from the natural realm as well. Again, as we said many times that science is now catching up with the Bible to show us some of these things that God said from the beginning are like, well, that's a great thing. And I guess he's God and he can do anything he wants. However, that's not something of the natural. We're seeing science is showing the natural and the supernatural can work hand in hand as in parting of the Red Sea into uh, walking through a human wall, as we said many times, when Jesus walked through the, the, the wall to his disciples and he had a glorified body. People say, well, soul and spirit can walk through the wall. Well, Jesus had a glorified body at that particular time. So how can a human body, well, he's Jesus, he's God. Well, that's true, he can do anything he wants, but he uses the dimensionalities of physics around him that we weren't aware of 30 years ago. It wasn't just recently, as we mentioned, I think several times at Caltech University says a human body can walk through a wall in the sixth dimension. And it was Einstein's theory of relativity that came to, to, to fruition in the early 1900s that says time is, a, is, is, a, is not a finite property. That means it fluctuates based on different atoms and, and uh, uh, different types of elements in, within, the, within the atmosphere so that the speed of light can change. And uh, so that's why time is outside of, of, of space, or time is outside of, uh, of being infinite or finite. So we're going to see a prayer that goes to uh, goes to the Lord. This is sung as a prayer song, and uh, sometimes in my prayer life that happens to me as well. I'll be praying at the Spirit, 
and the Spirit just takes over, and it comes and sounds like a song, a song of praise, as David used to sing the songs in, uh, in the psalmist, and uh, he would sing a psalm of praise. And this is similar to what the prophet's doing. He's combining a song with praise and a, a, a prayer, and that's where we're at. So let's get into the scripture. We invited the Holy Spirit to be our true teacher. Let's see what the prophet has to say, and how does this fit us today? Here we go, uh, short, short chapter of Havavakuk. A prayer of Havavakuk, the prophet, on, and the word here used, they're, they're not sure what the Hebrew word means here. It's kind of like the word sila. Sila uh, is still up in the air whether what it truly means, but they believe it's played to a musical instrument, like uh, where we say amen is the end of what we're, what we're particularly talking about. Sila would be of a mu mu musical instrument to put closure to it that when you see in the psalm this word here in the hebrew is, is they believe is similar to that so he's singing the prophet is singing a prayer to the lord in a, in a form of a song oh jehovah i've heard your speech and i was afraid we tremble at the speech of the lord because of his power and his glory it thunders and it lightning and the power that he holds and, and also the prophets felt for the people they felt for the people that, that there, there was going to be justice and we as Christians need to feel the, for that power coming about those who are unjust as well here today. That scandal after scandal, as we said, it's not going to just be Democrat. It's going to be Republican too. And we're seeing scandal after scandal. We're not going to get into this in this particular uh, uh, taping, but we'll probably do an update later on. Uh, the, the, the U.S. scandals are now uh, opening wider and deeper than anybody ever thought, much deeper. And another piece of evidence came out yesterday that the American media has not heard. And there's another piece coming on top of that that a lot of people haven't heard yet. This thing is blowing wide open and will be the greatest scandal in the history of the United States of America. You just watch as it's coming and coming and coming. It's just continuing to unwind. So this is the same thing that's happening in this day and age. Again, as Solomon said, nothing's new under the sun. History repeats itself when we don't learn from history. The only difference between the time of Habakkuk and us is we know what he's referring to later on in here as the time of trouble. The time of trouble is coming. The day of the Lord is coming. The time of Jacob's trouble, as the Old Testament is saying, is coming. We're running out of human time before we go and tabernacle with the Lord, the Most High, Jesus Christ, for a thousand years, literally, in a time element. And then after the white throne judgment, we enter into eternity with the Lord. And yes, eternity outside of time and space. We are no longer held back by the three and a half dimensions of the world that we live in today. We will live like him in his kingdom glory and all the dimensionalities that he is. So that's when you see in the scripture, we, we, we'll see Jesus as he is. And when you wonder what, what do you mean by that? Well, it doesn't mean we're gonna be like little Jesuses. It means we'll have a glorified body that sin and, and temptation cannot tempt, tempt us anymore. And we live in the dimensionality that he does, meaning we can walk through a physical water. That means we can portal uh, at, at the speed of light, the speed of thought, the speed of a blinking of an eye, traveling from Michigan to Israel, Jerusalem for the holy festivals in the twinkling of an eye. Praise his name. And again, science is showing us that they indeed are starting to do, be able to do that. We mentioned in one of our other studies, they have, they have taken a, a Coke can and, and put it through a portal through quantum physics, and they, and they transport it 60 feet. So based on that quantum physics theory mathematical formula, they believe there'll be a time in the near future that you'll be able to travel like, uh, like uh, what happened in the book of Acts. O Lord, Jehovah, I've heard your speech and was afraid. O Jehovah, revive your work in the midst of your years. Revive the work. Let the people see truth and let them repent. And that's what we pray to the world too before it's too late. Repent of your ways. We do not want justice. We want grace because nobody deserves God's justice because his justice is going to be harsh. We want the grace, and we pray no matter what they have done, that they will turn to the Most High God. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. Mary says the same thing. In your wrath, remember your great and loving mercy, because we all deserve wrath. We have sinned, and we're not better than anyone else. We just sin differently than other people. And the question is, are we getting, walking the right way? Are we moving forward as a work in progress in our spiritual life? Because we're not going to be perfect until the Lord takes us home. That's why we want to pray for those who are going through this, no matter what they've done, 
But Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. Love your enemy as yourself. Pray for mercy, not justice, because justice is of the Lord. The only, uh, the, uh, remember mercy. Uh, Elohim came from Taman, and the Holy One from Mount, Mount Paran. Paran is the, uh, the area of the south of the desert of uh, Sinai. His glory covered the heavens. Oh, his glory. That's where it is. It, literal essence is glory. That's the word kavod or kabod in, in the Hebrew. Means his literal glory, his literal essence, who he is. The, the, when, he, when he saw the, 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 uh, the fire at night and the cloud by day, that was the kavod. That was the, his, that's his glory. That's his literal essence. Covered the heavens, literally. His arm is not too small to reach. He is everywhere. And knowing that he is everywhere and he is all powerful and all loving, we can trust that we put our hands in him no matter what the world does to us. Our faith is in him and our home is on the high because he's got it. Time again that you trust him and trust him as Abraham trusts him. You see that he comes through again and again and again because he's God and he loves you. And the earth was full of his praise and that's what we're supposed to be as they went up to the third heaven. The cherubs sang. Actually, it was the uh, seraphim, according to uh, Isaiah. Oh, 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 holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The world, the earth is filled with his glory. I mean, his essence is all over the world. And that's how the name of this ministry came about, because it's his ministry called by his essence. It's for him and for to praise him. And that's what he loves to hear from his servants, the praise of the Most High God. How worthy, how glory you are, how, how, how hallowed is your name. I remember in our teaching yesterday in Moses, that were, that's where Moses got it wrong. He didn't hallow God. And he didn't hallow God even though he was the most humble man that ever was in the Bible and probably ever lived. He didn't hallow God that one time because he let frustration of the Israelites take over. And he was yanked from the promised land. And that's how God is, is true. He does, he's not going to share his hallow. He's not going to share his glory with anyone. It's for his glory and it's for his purpose. Verse four, his brightness was like the light, literally. We know when we go into eternal light, eternal life, after the white throne judgment, there'd be no sun and moon because it will be his literal light will be the essence. This is not a figure of speech. The more we peel back, the more literal he's talking about. He had rays flashing from his hands. Literally, if people have talked about that, seeing Jesus rays flashing from his hands. He is, he is God Almighty. And there his power was hidden. His power is in him. Praise his holy, holy name. Pray, pray, pray for his holy name. Before him went pestilence and fever followed at his feet. Destruction went, but the Lord oh God Almighty is the God that will come to heal all. And we pray that we the healing of the nations because of the sin and the demonic that Satan has run wild for years and years and years in the spirit of Jezebel. This is a spiritual war we're into today. And the prayers of the saints have to be the artillery fire to fight off the enemy. We need all prayers, prayer warriors to come against this evil uh, demonic that Satan is trying to dig in in these latter days. Before he went, pestilence and fever befold his uh, fever followed his feet. Verse six, he stood and measured the earth. He stood. The God Almighty measured the earth because He created it all. Can you imagine a God measuring the earth? It's just how glorious He is. Because we we look at God; He's the only one that can do that. Satan is a created being. He can go. He can't be in two places or three places at once. And he can't measure the earth. He's a created angel. He was a he was a great cherub that rebelled against the Lord. Only the God Almighty, the God of the universe, can do such a thing. And he looked and startled the nations. He looked and the nations were startled just by his look because they know justice will be served. And the everlasting mountains were scattered. Literally, the mountains will scatter. How can a mountain scatter? Because God can melt a mountain. And he can literally move it through his power and his glory. And we know through quantum physics that indeed can happen. The perpetual hills bowed. This is not a figure of speech. They bowed. Even the hills will bow down to the glory of God. You say, you've lost your mind. How can a hill bow down to God? Because he's God and quantum physics is starting to show these things can be real. They have life in them. And God is the maker of all things. He is the creator of all things. And all things will bow down and call him the most high and all praise will go to him. He, his ways are everlasting. His ways are everlasting. He won't go, he won't wear out. He's from the beginning and the end. 
I get I get this question asked from a couple family members all the time. Uh, it's the same family member. They say, uh, um, what, 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 the, the question I want to ask God is, who made you? And he's, he, here he says, it help, helps us with the answer. His ways are everlasting. He is everlasting. So when people ask me, who made God? That's, he had the perfect comeback to, to Moses in the burning bush. I am that I am. I am that I am. That means there was no beginning before me. I'm everlasting. I am the alpha. I am the omega. I am the beginning and I am the end. There was nothing before me and there was nothing after me because I am God. I am the only one God, the true God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of my son that I gave to you for everlasting life. So we're seeing this uh, everlasting. I saw the tents of Cushion and affliction, and the curtains of the land of the Midian trembled. Cush was uh, was against God. It's the area of the uh, uh, of the Middle Eastern area of Africa. Mid Midian is a is a modern area of the Saudi Arabia. These are they trembled because they were worshiping other gods, and their affliction. The curtains of the land of Midian trembled. The literal land will tremble. It will tremble and tremble and tremble and bow down and know who the Most High God is. And the people obviously have a choice. They have a soul that is in them to choose eternal life. That's why God shows his wrath at the right time. That's why God shows his patience all the time. Because he's giving you the patience of every single person to, to look around the skies and challenge what they've learned in their upbringing. Did my tradition of my religion, how truth is it? I've heard so many stories of imams in the nation of, of, of Islam studying the Quran, that before, many of you here that have had supernatural experiences where Jesus has visited them in visions and dreams and they turn their life over the Lord. I mean, it's happening more and more than in the history. I can't tell you how many times people have come to his glory and told me the same story about, I saw God in a vision and I was a Muslim. I was a terrorist. I was killing Christians. I was doing X, Y, Z, and I saw the living Christ. And now I'm a pastor and now I'm a believer in, in Jesus Christ. I've given my life to Christ. But even imams now are challenging the, the, the word of Muhammad and saying, let me find truth. Let's see where the truth is. Generation after generation have never challenged truth. We have a really unique generation of millennials, and I don't know what they're called, the Generation Z, I believe what they're called today. They're not going through the traditions, and some of it is rebellion. And trust me, being a parent of these, of these kids, it's, it's, they, they're not like we were. Some of that's good and some of that's bad. But the good part of it, it tells us it's the days of Joel. Joel says, your young men will have visions and your old men will have dreams. And the, the, they will prophesy. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. They'll have signs and wonders around them. They're more in tuned to, to asking the question, why? We're seeing the youth of Iran rebel against the Ayatollahs. We're seeing them re re uh, rebel against the traditions of their, of their nation and what they've been told from generation to generation. They're saying, no, we wanna know truth. We're they're not saying down and death to America. They're not saying down and death to uh, uh, the little Satan, Israel. That's the fathers that are saying that from the, from the imams that have been taught this hatred towards Little Satan, Israel, and, and, and big Satan, the United States of America. But this young generation that we see coming into his glory, 85% of the followers of his glory are under 34 years old. They fit into the, 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 the Generation Z. So you're listening to this. You're a unique generation that are not taking the traditions of your fathers and your mothers anymore, and you're looking for truth. And that's what Jesus said, the truth will set you free. And Jesus is the most... The most um, controversial figure on the face of the earth because people, all religions are trying to find out who he is. And all cults that are say they're Christian or say they are of Christ use Jesus in another way that other than what he is. Either Jesus Christ is, is the son of God and the son of man, and he is the way, the truth, or the life, or he's not. As Paul says, if he didn't die on the cross and resurrected on the third day, then Christianity's for naught. It doesn't mean anything. But if he indeed did that, which he did, which is overwhelmingly proved throughout what God is showing us today, unequivocally, everywhere you turn. That's why the Lord is saying, challenge it. Test me. See who I am and see who my son is. 
And in the Quran, people are asking me, I got, I got imams that are asking me questions about the Quran. And they, uh, I mentioned this before, the Lord told me two years ago to get into the Quran and study the Quran. And I got a copy of the Quran here, I think I've showed this before. I've gone hour after hour after hour after hour studying the Quran, and I have all my post-it notes of all the things in the Quran. The question he asked yourself, well, why would God want you to read the Quran and understand the Quran? Because people who are coming from Islam only understand the Quran. And they want, we need to show them who Jesus is from the Quran, from their own teaching. Because the imams are coming to me and saying, yeah, nobody ever explained that to me in iman school. That's a good question. I want to go back and find out the truth. So you plant the seed. You don't give them the Bible. You don't say to a Muslim person, here's the Bible, read the Bible. All the answers are in the Bible here. Take the Bible. Go. They're going to like, the Bible? It's like taking in a Jewish person that is in Judaism and saying, here's the New Testament. Read the New Testament and every, all your problems will go away. They're like, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm, I'm raised not to, ra to understand. I was raised not to even look at the New Testament. It's false. We have Moses and the prophets. That's what we're supposed to study. Same with the Quran. We're supposed to study Muhammad's words from the vision that Muhammad had. So Muhammad had an issue. If you follow the story of Muhammad, you go deep. To find the truth about Muhammad. Muhammad had to come up with a way from his life. How did the world exist prior to Muhammad? And how did the world exist after Muhammad? So he had to go to the Torah to fill in the gaps. So that's where the Quran says the Torah is a holy book. Isaiah is a holy prophet. Gabriel is a holy angel. David is a, ho is a, is a, is a, pro is a holy prophet in the Quran. So if you go to Isaiah... The Torah, and all these places where the Quran says it's a holy book, because Muhammad didn't have an answer for that before. He just said the Torah is a holy book. Every single page of that, every one of those prophets points to Jesus Christ. Then they'll even tell you that the gospel is a holy book. But they'll try to go out of the way to say the gospel is a holy book, but Jesus is just a prophet. Well, that contradicts what the word gospel means. Gospel means that the Christ, according to the scripture, the Messiah, the anointed one, who will rule over the world, as the prophet Isaiah said, as King David said, that all salvation will go through the Son. Yes, David said that in Psalm 2. All salvation will go through the Son. Prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 9 says, he'll have the world on his shoulders, and his kingdom will never end. He'll be called Wonderful, Comforter, Father. That's the head. And he says, mighty Al, mighty God, he's God. They call it, Isaiah calls him God. So the gospel tells us that that God, that El, will reign forever under his father David. And that's exactly what David said. And that's exactly what the prophet Gabriel said as well to Mary in the gospel. Mary, you're most blessed. You'll have the son of God. Yes, the son of God. And he'll be of his father David for the Davidic covenant. And his kingdom will never end. And he'll rule over the house of Jacob, who is Israel, forever. Those are my words. Those are Gabriel's words. The holy angel of the Quran. And that's what the gospel means, that the Messiah, according to the scripture, according to the Old Testament, according to the prophets and Moses, would come. And as Daniel said, the Messiah would be cut off and killed in the, in the, in the book of Daniel. Not for his own transgressions, but the transgressions of the people. And that's exactly what happened. But on the third day, he'll rise again as our first fruit, our intercessor, our high priest in the order of Melchizedek. And there was over 500 witnesses that saw it with their own eyes. And every disciple that, sp that split exactly the way the prophets said would happen. When Christ went to the cross, the prophets said that his disciples would bolt because they thought it was a lie. And they were going out to try to protect themselves. Well, you don't die for a lie. If you've had first eye hand experience and you saw with your own eyes that he died and you fleed, you don't come back unless you see with your own eyes that he rose again. And over 500 people saw him rise again. That is the official definition of the gospel. So many imams are like, I didn't know that. Nobody taught me that. Nobody ever asked the question, why? What does the Torah mean? What does the Torah say? What does the gospel mean? What does the gospel say? 
I've just listened from tradition to tradition that Jesus is a wonderful man, he's a prophet. But the Gospels are holy in the Quran. It says so right here in the Quran that the Gospels are a holy book, but Jesus is a prophet. But that contradicts what the Gospel says. We have to know what truth is, and the truth is the only thing that set you free. And this generation that's coming up, we know it's the end days. Because you beautiful generation of you, 85% out there in every country in the world, and the majority listening today are in Muslim nations that have come through traditions of a different religion. You're seeking truth. I can't tell you how many times I answer that question every day in private. Somebody coming up to me, tell me who Jesus is. And I don't tell them who it is. I just show them where to go in the Quran and ask the question. We have technology at our fingertips now, which is amazing. This is the way God is showing us the end days. He said, he said through Daniel, knowledge will go to and fro in Daniel 12. He's given the knowledge to know who he is, the knowledge to, that he will be revealed. And the technology that it's right at our fingertips, whether our phones to be able to go up and Google something or search something and find truth and find out the living word of God. It was great. I was watching uh, uh, his glory and his, his glory Facebook uh, for those who follow us on Facebook. I think we're, cl we're close to 1.2 million followers on Facebook in every country in the world. Um, our other platforms are a little f further behind, but they'll catch up. God, God will get them caught up. Um, but there was this woman, uh, and I think it was in Indonesia, we put up some, uh, some, some biblical verses on our, our uh, Facebook site, uh, word for word what, what the scripture says, for encouragement, lifting up. And uh, this, this, this uh, I don't know how old she is, but I would, I would assume generation, I think it's called Generation Z, the, last, the generation that we're in right now. She went to her, her phone and did a, 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 a picture of her phone. And she was able to get the same verse up there and show me or show his glory that, see, I'm able to get this in Indonesia. I'm able to get this in Pakistan. I'm able to get this sneakingly way in Iran or Saudi Arabia. You know, we almost have, we have so many followers in Saudi Arabia. It's absolutely amazing how many are in Saudi Arabia. Like I said, 85% of our followers are Muslim countries, and they are the generation, uh, the younger generation, just like the book of Joel. And as the rabbis say, coincidence is not a kosher word. They're coming in, and they're asking the question, and that's why the Lord said, my son, you need to learn the Quran, because that's how they speak. That's how you talk to them. That's how you talk to some, I'm, I'm part Jewish, but if I'm going to talk to somebody that is a very orthodox Jew, I'm not going to explain things from the, from the New Testament because of right over their head. They don't want to hear it. No, 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 New Testament, no. You want to talk to me about Isaiah? You want to talk to me about the, the Torah? Okay, I'll talk to you about the Torah. Show them who the Christ is in the Torah. Show them who the Christ is through King David. And they'll look at it and they'll, they'll study it. And, and we go even deeper. Let's go into the Hebrew and see what he actually is saying. You speak Hebrew, right? Yeah, yeah, I speak Hebrew. See what David said in Hebrew? This is an English version. I'm not translating it for my benefit. What did God literally say to King David in the Hebrew? Who is this, Who is this guy? This is exactly what happened. Isaiah 53, which is in the middle of the Israeli uh, museum today in Jerusalem. Right there, Isaiah 53. Remember, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, they found the entire scroll of Isaiah. Some believe that may have been the same scroll that Jesus taught from uh, when he was walking, uh, in, when he was in, in, in the temple and he literally sat down the, the, the scroll of Isaiah and said, to this day, this has been fulfilled before your very eyes, Bible prophecy. Because they believe that was part of the 70 AD that they took the scrolls out to the Qumran caves where they found the Dead Sea Scrolls. So Isaiah 53, if you if you studied our Isaiah 53, go to Isaiah 53. It's the most incredible, most detailed portion of the Messiah dying on the cross. It's just incredible. Incredible how vivid it is. So incredible that two different heresies have come out of that. One is called the double, the dual Isaiah theory. That, well, and there's 66 books or 66 chapters in the book of Isaiah. And they match perfectly the New Testament versus the Old Testament. Exactly the same number. So they, they assume that there are, two, there are two different Isaiahs because the Isaiah is speaking from an Old Testament look, from an Old Testament perspective and a New Testament perspective. It's called the dual Isaiah theory. I don't think many believe in this anymore. So you can spend many, many hours trying to be uh, an intellect to try to study that, or you go to what Jesus said in the Gospel of John. 
he, he quotes Isaiah 6, and he, he quotes Isaiah, I believe it's Isaiah 53. He said that same Isaiah, if you read it in the Greek, that same Isaiah says, so Jesus is telling us who is the author of the word, that the author, Isaiah in 6, is the same one in 53. So we don't need to go and do hours of hours of, 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 of library study to see if there's two Isaiahs, because the author of the word, Jesus Christ, says it's the same Isaiah. So it saves us a lot of time. In Judaism, they do, because you ask the question, how do they deny the Messiah in Isaiah 53? And how do they deny it when it's sitting in the museum right there in, right in your eyes? And remember, so people thought that this was so perfect that it had to be written afterwards. Well, we know that it was carbon, that we know that exact scroll that was found in the Qumran cave was carbon dated back to 450 BC. Some say 250 BC. So either or, between 250 and 450 BC, even at the least, 250 years before Christ was even born, this was, was written to prove without a shadow of a doubt that the Christ is who he says he is and he did what he said he was going to do. So how do you explain that if you're in Judaism? So some of them have taken the Isaiah 53 completely out of their Bible. That would be more orthodox. That would be more religious Jews that are more strong into this thing. They pull it out. And some use it as an allegory, kind of a replacement theology backwards. They say it's just an allegory of the nation of Israel, where replacement th theology says in the church today that the church has replaced Israel. It's kind of the reverse back then that that is an allegory of Israel, not of a human being, of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And the truth is, you read it literally. And the literally you read it, the more literal you read it, there it is, right before your eye. You can't deny it. It's in the it's in the museum as we speak today. You walk right into the Jerusalem Museum, and there it is on display, Isaiah 53, in the entire scroll of Isaiah right there, proving again God is who he says he is, and his son is who he says he is. We kind of got off on a rabbit trail, but it's really good to know the truth, and this is the time that we seek the truth because many are looking for truth today instead of going through the traditions. So when many are just puzzled at this ministry called by the name of God, how do you know almost so much about the Jewish part of it? Because we have a Jewish God, and I'm part Jewish. And if you don't know all 66 books, then you don't know the whole Bible. God wants us to have all of them. He said, precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. Many are blown away that we do Torah studies. Many are blown away that Havavakuk? Who ever does a study on Havavakuk? What does that have to do with me today? has a lot to do with you today because God has never changed his stripes. He's the same God of love and patience, but he's also a God that is, has a wrath. You get to choose whether you want the wrath or you want the love, peace, hope, joy, hope. The question is today, you're running out of time. Habakkuk did, well, they, humanly speaking, they didn't because when your flesh dies, it's too late. But we know based on the, the, the scripture we know on the prophets, without unequivocal, we know what Jesus told us in Matthew 24. We are in the latter days. There's no doubt about it because every symbol, every prophecy has been fulfilled and we're showing the last days. So the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the, and the shaking that we're seeing throughout the nations is of God. He is shining the light of disinfectant to all the darkness and he's revealing it. And inside that, he's going to raise up a remnant for his purpose and his glory. And his glory shall shine all over the world exactly the way it says here. His glory shines from the heavens. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The world is filled with his glory. And that's what we have to say every day. The world is filled with his glory. Are we going to get in his glory? Or are we going to stay in the world and be frustrated? O Lord, O Jehovah, were you displeased with the rivers? Was your anger against the rivers? Because he can change the rivers. Was your wrath against the sea? Remember, the sea is the idiom of the second death. There will be no sea in eternal life for the Lord, too. No sun, no moon, because he is the literal light. And there's time is outside. Remember, we, t we keep time on a solar or a lunar calendar. We're outside of time and space. We don't keep time anymore. It's God's own time. And we only, one of the re only ways we can really keep time is the festivals in, in eternal life. And the healing of the nations of the leaves that come every month. So we'll have a somewhat of a time, at, uh, but we will not be in the normal time frame of the solar and the lunar. We'll be on God's time, outside of time, in his, his dimensionality. And there's no more sea, because death has been done away with once and for all. There's no more death. There's no more sin. 
You, that you rode your horses, your chariots of salvation. You, you literally got on the horses and rode. Remember, Elisha says, let, let, let my servants see. The Syrian army has surrounded us. There's more of us than them, servant. Servant looks at Elisha and says, you must be smoking something. I don't know what, because the entire Syrian army is out there against us, Elisha. And the God allows the servant to be able to open his eyes. And he sees chariots of God's horses of angels surrounding. That's what it is. It is literal. There's chariots of God's horses around his beloved everywhere. He's sending his angels out now to declare battle. They're in battle array right now for this end time outpouring. The angels are at attention. The angels of the Lord are ready to open the doors of his revival as we speak. And we cry out to the Lord. Open your doors, Lord, of revival. Pour your glory and your spirit over the world because your glory fills the world. Your chariots of salvation. He is this only way of salvation. Your bow is made quite ready. The bow of affliction, the, whole, the Lord of hosts, the bow is in position. Oaths were sworn over your arrows and you will go perfectly. Here the word here is selah. They're done to a musical instrument. So the prophet was singing this and playing a musical instrument. See, I couldn't have been a prophet of, of old because I can't sing and I can't play a musical instrument. I can't even hum. I can, I can barely whistle. So the Lord would have to use me for something different. But this prophet in David, and I'm of the line of David. I'm from the tribe of Judah, but Judah, I didn't get that DNA to be able to sing psalms like David could sing psalms or play the harp like David could play the harp. Oh, what the glory and the beautiful music we're going to hear in heaven. The peace of David playing the harp. David, will you play the harp for us? Let's have a Bible study. Let's bring Samuel out. Come on, Samuel, come on up here. David, play the harp. Walk us through that time with Saul again and how you played the harp and what you were thinking, what, what you were going through, and how you gave us inspiration to make it through the day. What a glorious time it's going to be. You divided the earth with rivers. You, this thing, this world just didn't show up this way. Look out, see things. Go to Google Maps and use technology. Go to Google Maps and go into an area and you're like, wow. Go into the nation of Israel. Google Map Israel and then just, just you got you, you, if you have an iPhone or uh, I'm not sure how the other phones, but you can open it up by just pushing it on your iPad or your iPhone. You can see the more you be, the more green, the more green. Exactly what Isaiah said would happen. It was a desert. Mark Twain said it's the most God-forsaken place on the earth when he visited in the 1900s. It is blossoming like a rose, literally. Ex number one exporter of fruit to, to Europe, to the EU. And the number one exporter of flowers to Holland. It is blossoming like a rose. Israel is the most advanced agriculture, uh, water, uh, irrigation system in the world. And many are saying that the end time battle may not be over oil and gas or a combination of oil and gas and the lack of resources of water. Iran is having a horrible time with water. Yemen's having a horrible time with water. Out of a lot of the Arabic nations have had oil for years and rich in the black gold oil. But they're running out of water, and water is literally the, the lifeblood of growth to be able to grow your, your, your products. And Israel is the most advanced technology in irrigation, and they have the most advanced technology uh, that the United States is even looking for on the West Coast, as taking salt from the sea and being able to bring that into natural water. And it's called it's a desalting program that they have invented the technology. And that's exactly what the prophet said in the end days too, that I will bless Israel more than any time in its history. And God is doing that to the nation of Israel. He is blessing them with technology. He's blessing them with water. Yesterday, we, we put an article up that uh, the Leviathan and the uh, Tamar out on the water on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea where they found natural gas and oil, the first, uh, first one, they're actually cut a deal that they're shipping uh, uh, natural gas to Egypt. So when they're now becoming a natural gas and oil, the old famous saying is that when God told Moses to go into the promised land, he told him, God told him the wrong way because the promised land was the only area that didn't have oil and gas. Every Arab nation had it, but it's just like God to wait to the last minute to strike the oil, to hit the stone, to take the rod. And out of the flinty rock comes the oil and comes the water, the living water. 
The mountain saw you and trembled. The overflowing of the water passed by. The deep uttered the voice. Is that a figure of speech? No, the deep uttered the voice. The deep is the depth of the sea. That is the area of Sheol. They uttered their voice. Exactly saying, hey, he is the God of glory as we, as we should have known. And he lifted his hands on high. The sun and moon stood still in their habitation. We know the sun and moon will be gone. And he had Joshua hold the sun back. And now, uh, I believe it was NASA, one of the American uh, uh, Institute, one of American, it has proven that the, there indeed happened the, exactly on record a day that the, the sun stood still, as the book of Joshua tells us. It, it went back in time. And we are now in science showing that you can go back in time because, with, through quantum physics. Uh, the light of your arrows they went, and the shining of your glittering spear the glittering of a spear, the, 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 the sapphire of the rod. If you listen and study it in the book of Enoch, in the, in the book of Yasser, how more than a rod that, that Moses and Aaron had. And then it went all the way back to the days of Adam. You marched through the land of indignation. You trampled the nations in, ignor, in anger. You went through the, the nations of indignation. They, they, they hold you, you'll hold them in derision. You trample them in anger. God has patience. But when the patience is out and he knows the heart is, is, is going to the second death, he says, I'm stepping in. And that's going to happen in the end days. We see that in the tribulation. We see this as God is shaking the world today to show his last revival. You went forth for the salvation of your people. Why did you do it? You went forth for the salvation of your people. How can it be your people, but yet some didn't choose you? People always ask me that. Were you preordained or were you chosen? Or did, you, or did you have to choose? Yeah, there used to be debates about this in seminary for hours. You know, one can't this, you, once saved, always say preordained versus uh, salvation. No, it's very simple. God knows the beginning and, and the end. And years ago, you can say, oh yeah, he's God. He, he knows the beginning and the end. Well, we know now that you can go forward in time and you can go backward in time. Quantum physics has shown us that you can do that. They've, they've shown that with an astronaut going back in time, that you could go back 22 years. You, the Chuck Missler did a study on that long ago. It's absolutely amazing. And God is telling us uh, exactly what he means. You went forth for the salvation of your people. So he went forth for the salvation of his people. The reason we're here is for the salvation of his people. How are we called his people? The only way you're called his people is if you choose him through his son in the new covenant, Jesus Christ, you are his people. You become sons and daughters of the Most High. And he knew what you were going to do before he even did it, before you did it. He knew it before the beginning of time. But he knew, but he gave you free will. So he also knows the wicked. So when the death of the wicked comes, it, it grieves the Lord. He doesn't, he doesn't delight in the death of the wicked, as the scripture tells us multiple places. But he knows the condition of their heart. He knows the beginning and the end with that person too, that they will never choose no matter what, because he sees the beginning and the end. Some say, well, it's like a DVR. You watch the football game, and you, know, you can go, go, go forward and see what the end of the game is. No, it's deeper than that, because every step of going backwards, he can change things and open doors and open doors and open doors and open doors. And the question is, how many doors are you going to get open for you that, that you're just going to say, nah, 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 nah? All have had chances to know the glory of God. Paul tells us in the scripture, all have known. Every single person has had the opportunity to know the glory of the one God. And are you going to pass by it for the day? Satan said, no, look at me, Fortnite, get on Fortnite. Get on this, get on that, anything but to have your heart on the tablet of God's word. You went forth for the salvation of your people, for salvation was with your anointed. Woo, salvation is with your anointed. Who's his anointed? The Messiah. The Christ, his son. As King David tells us in Psalm 2, remember we in a Psalm 2 study. Go to our website, Psalm 2. It's the most incredible. It's the, it's, the, it's the history of the world. All done in one psalm. You have the Father speaking. Then you have the Son speaking. Then you have the Holy Spirit speaking. The Holy Spirit speaks in conclusion through King David in the psalm in Psalm 2. And he says, the salva kiss the Son for the salvation is through the Son. This is through King David in Psalm 2 for our Muslim friends and our Jewish friends in Judaism. The anointed one, the Messiah, the salvation. How perfect is God in his word? The word Yehovah. 
As Dr. Barnsdale teaches us that Jehovah literally means a three-part God as well. We know the word Elohim in the Hebrew grammatically means three. It can't mean two, it can't mean four. That's the God, God Elohim. That's why for you who speak English, when you read Genesis, God made a man in our image. Why is it plural? It's because Elohim means three. Our in the English can be two or three, four, however, many. But in, in Hebrew, it's grammatically correct as three, and that's the God of three. And in Judaism, three is the number of God's, the, the completion of God's spirit. How perfect is that? God is perfect in everything he does. Jehovah means, what does Jehovah mean? That's what he says in three parts. That's Jehovah, Yahweh of God. So he names his only begotten son to come onto the earth. And, and, and the angel tells Mary, again, Gabriel. Gabriel even named Jesus. Gabriel even named, his name will be Jesus. Jesus is his Greek name. What's his name in Hebrew? Yeshua. Yeshua. Yeshua the Messiah. Yeshua the King. What does Yeshua mean? Yeshua in Hebrew means Jehovah is salvation. Pun intended. God is precise in what he means. The only salvation is through my son, Yeshua, the Messiah, the anointed one. Salvation. See where all the pieces and parts come together? It's always pointing to Christ. We're in a vava cook and we're seeing Christ. How about that? How fun is that? Because God is telling us we need to have all the pieces and parts together. So we see the picture of God clearly. And it takes diligence to put all the pieces together. That's what God is seeking from us. Do you love me with all your heart, your soul, and your mind? Are you going to seek me with all my word? Or are you going to be lazy and just to go to the, the cliff notes? I remember when I was in high school, I tried to get the cliff notes. Just give me the cliff notes. I, don't, I, I just want to I just want to pass the test. I just want to get through the test. I just, I just want to make sure that I, 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 I get a good enough grade that I can keep playing sports. That's it. God doesn't want you to be like that. Don't just give me enough. He wants all of it, all of it to come in. That's why Isaiah said, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. All 66 books by 40 authors, an integrated message system for us to know who he is with a love relationship. How great is our God? Should be a song called that, isn't there? Yeah, it's a wonderful song. You don't want me to sing it. Trust me. My mom doesn't even want me to sing it. She told me he used to lip sync in church. You thrust your thrill with his own arrows, the head of his villages. They came out like the world one to scatter me. Their rejoicing was like feasting of the poor in the secret. The wicked are coming after us. And they, it's like feasting of the poor in secret. That's what the, 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 the kings do. They rage, they rage, they rage in anger to, to puff up, to, to have power and authority and gain for the world's reasons and to try to come against the Most High God. But God will hold them in derision. He wants us to seek truth with our heart. It's an exciting time we're about to enter, the greatest time in the history of the world. Literally, all the prophets of old would have loved to be where we're at today, to see these end time amazing, amazing harvests where we can literally on earth before our king comes Say, glory, 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 holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is filled with his glory, his glory, his glory, his glory. You walk through the sea on, with your horses, though the heap of great waters. Can he walk through the sea on his horses? He does. He can walk on water. Our lifeguard walks on water, and he walks over the sea with his horses. The sea is death, the second death. He tramples over the second death through his son. His son beat the second death, and we accept his son as our Lord of our life. We have beat the second death. The second death is the sea, the idiom of, of, of death into the lake of, or into, into Sheol forever, then to the lake of fire. Though the heap of great waters, when he, he walks on water. How many other people do you know that literally walked on water? Well, Peter did for a while. I was like Christ, and that's a great message for us. When Peter had his heart focused on the Lord, and he's looking in his eyes how glorious it can be when you see the Lord God Almighty, the Son of God, the King of Kings, Lord of hosts, walking to you on the Sea of Galilee. And he's saying, come here, Peter. And you see the glory of his face, the radiance of his face. And you're filled with his glory. And you're walking. And you've got your eyes on him. And you're physically walking on water. And all of a sudden, the humanness of you steps back in. Then you sink. That's the way we are in life. We sink when we try to do it ourselves. 
But when we're in his word and we're in the Holy Spirit, with him guiding us, we can walk on water. When I heard, my body trembled. My lips quivered at the voice. Rottenness entered my bones, and I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. The day of trouble, the day of day, uh, Jacob's trouble. When he comes up to the people, he will invade them with his troops. What troops? The saints coming on white horses. The prophets going to the end day, the day of trouble, the day of Jacob's trouble. He wanted to be hidden that he could rest in that day of trouble. So God only gives the rest in that day of trouble to the, to, to the church that has been harpazo. Everyone else has to go through the day of the trouble. Another reference to the harpazo of the church. Though the fig tree may not blossom. What do you mean the fig tree won't blossom? This is, fig tree is a reference to Israel, specifically Israel. No fruit on the vines. That's not, remember, God, Jesus said that's not a good thing. No fruit on the vines because it will become that it will be barren in the last days of the tribulation before the day of the Lord. Though the labor of the olive may fail, the labor won't work anymore. The old ways is done. God has said judgment is up. Satan is let loose for the last season and the end is coming. And the, the, but the fields you no, yield no food. Remember the quarter the scales of barley one day's worth of, of meal for your for for working in the days of, of our teaching in the book of Revelation it'll be that way it'll be famine and it'll be hyper uh, inflation that you won't be able to uh, one day's worth of work will literally be just enough to feed you those days are coming though the flock may be cut off from the fold there will be no herd in the stall the flock may be cut off from the fold the question is, are you a part of the shepherd's fold? Are you the sheep that know the voice of the shepherd? The sheep know my voice. And it's literally, that's literally a, a dual meaning be, behind that. One, the sheep literally know the voice of the, of the shepherd. We, the stronger we get into our walk with Jesus Christ, the more we hear his voice and we know his voice. His voice, I've heard his voice for many, many years now. At first, I didn't know because I wasn't strong in the word to really realize who it was. And I first thought, when I first heard the word of God speak to me, I thought I was absolutely lose, I'm losing my mind. And the more and deeper I got, the more deeper, and I recognized his voice. And now I know his voice. But this also is in the natural way, too. You know that in shepherds, real shepherds that have sheep, you go to Ireland or you go to Scotland or Israel today where they're still handling sheep. You can have a, a group of four shepherds bringing their whole herds of sheep together. And one shepherd may say, come, let's go. We're going here. And only the sheep, uh, only the shepherd sheep of that particular flock follow him. So the sheep literally know the voice of the shepherd and only follow the shepherd. They don't follow the other flocks because they literally know his voice and are in tune to his voice. And then God is using that as an idiom, but is also using that as a literal sense. We're in tune to his voice. Do we trust our shepherd? Is our shepherd going to lay down his life for us, the sheep? What a shepherd gate is, remember Jesus says, I am the door. People say, oh, it's a door. Yeah, okay, you're, Jesus is a door. What else are you going to tell me now? That's literal. See how the, see how the Bible's an allegory? Because here they're saying Jesus is a door. Are we going to knock on him? Well, he told us to knock. Knock on the door. That's, he's the door. So we go to the Amer uh, Webster's Dictionary. Go ahead and Google this up. At, go to Webster's Dictionary and, at, and, and see what the definition of a door is. It says any obstacle. We, look at, we think of door in our mind because it's tradition, that it's a metal or wood door that you walk through or a glass door that you walk through. So we're saying, oh, Jesus is literally a door. But the definition from the, the, the dictionary says any obstacle or object that allows one to come in or stops one from coming out or vice versa. So, so it, it goes through a literal door. It, it can be anything that stops that. So in ancient Israel, until to, and still to this day they do this, there's places in Israel when you go on a, a tour and God willing, we're going to go to Israel this year and then do a uh, partner's visit next year. Uh, I hope to go to Israel in November of this particular year. If you go to Israel and you go and see a, a real shepherd, they have a shepherd's gate and it's a circle. And there's literally only one way into the shepherd's gate. And, and the sheep go into the shepherd's gate and it's surrounded and there's a gate on all sides and there's no way for the sheep to get out except through that one door, how literally that is. Well, there's no physical door in the shepherd's gate. The, the, the shepherd himself lays down in front of the sheep 
to protect them from the wolves and the lions and the bears back in ancient Israel or today protect them from whatever, uh, uh, whatever uh, thing that would try to kill them. But the shepherd is literally the door. He lays, he lays down in front of them. And when Jesus says, I lay down my life for you, I lay down as the shepherd. And my sheep know my voice and there's only one way in. And I am the door and you can only knock and accept me because I'm the only way in and I'm the only way out. That is so literal. So the more we peel back this, the more we see, jeez, it's literal. Never thought of a door being it could be a human be a door. Yeah, that's what the dictionary says. So there will be no hurt in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in Jehovah. I will, I will joy in Elohim, my salvation. So now the prophet sees all this. He's singing of praise, giving his heart to the Lord in prayer of our, our tribulations. And that's how we do is pray in the spirit too. And when I pray in the spirit, I, I sense the same pattern that Habakkuk is going through. The burdens that we don't know what to pray for, the unctions that come out, that's why praying in the spirit is so important because we don't know what to pray for. That's where the Holy Spirit intercedes for us. But I can feel the burdens of what I'm praying for, the things of the world of the, of the, of the, uh, the firefight of, the, of the, um, the enemy, the spirit of Jezebel, the spiritual warfare that's going on or a loved one or a friend that needs, that needs, uh, needs a prayer help, an intercessor prayer. So you feel that. You can feel the tension when you're praying, but you don't know what it's saying. But you can, Sometimes I get a vision. When I'm praying in the spirit, I'll see a vision of a person. I don't see them acting out, but I, I see a vision of that person's face as clear as day, like they're right in front of me. And I know somehow I'm praying for that person. I know what or why, but I know it's intense. But when it comes down to the end of my prayer session, it turns this way, always turns this way. It goes, it goes, it starts out in a slow introduction in the praying of the spirit. Then it gets intense of whatever I'm praying for, the spiritual warfare, whatever God is interceding through the Holy Spirit. And then it always ends in a sense of peace, just like he's praying here in, in, in the sense of peace. You get a peace that comes over you when you're done. And a lot of times when I'm done, I just take a deep breath and I just meditate on the Lord. I, wow. I just get this joy, peace that comes over me that you can't explain. That's the peace of the Lord. And that's why he wants you to pray in the spirit. It's up, uplifting. You will rejoice in Jehovah. I will, I will joy in Elohim as my salvation. That's his promise. And you physically and spiritually can feel that when you pray in the spirit like that. How great is our God? The Jehovah Elohim is my strength. That's what we have to remember always. The Jehovah Elohim is my strength. He will make my feet like the deer's feet. You ever watched a deer? They're incredible. So are, so, so are goats on the mountains, but that's another time. We were watching a deer in the natural jump over a fence not too long ago. And then how nimble they are is absolutely amazing. And how how they will take off and jump and their feet just land. They're like ballerinas. They're, they're perfect. And that's what he's saying. I'll make your feet like the deer. That means the path that I give for you, your feet will be like the deer. You will be attached to the path I have before you because I love you so much, son or daughter. And he will make me walk on my high hills. And walk on the high hills and not be afraid to slip like the goat walks on these high hills. And they wrote, goats walk at these angles, and you thought it's not humanly possible or goatly impossible uh, to walk this way. But the goat does. So God's telling us the same thing. You walk on my holy hill, and you walk at any angle that the world says you can't walk on. I will provide it for you because I am your Savior. I am your salvation. I am your God. And my son is the way, the truth, and the life. He is literally the shepherd, and he is literally the door. To the chief musician with stringed in instruments, it's the way the psalmist and the David used to have, to the chief musician with stringed in instruments. That means this prayer from Avavakuk was prayed, not only did he pray, and it was sung, but it was done to a musical instrument. How beautiful that's gonna be when we get to heaven to hear those musical instruments. We've never been into the harp and all that kind of classical music and stuff, but I have a feeling I'm gonna really enjoy it when we get to heaven, to, to hear David play the harp. Wow. How cool will that be? And David tell a story. S -s 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 tell us some of the Psalms. <laughs> Live. <laughs> you know, 4, 4K technology. David literally in heaven giving us a Bible story from what he literally went through. 
playing it with a harp. Oh, can't get any better than that. Well, we wrap up uh, the third chapter of Avavakuk. We pray that this has been a blessing to you. And we'll see you on the next chapter. May, God, may, may the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob bless you today and always. God bless you.